The Christian Atheist is also available on YouTube, and you will find other great content, including the literature I frequently refer to, on our Simple Gifts podcast. If you find our content helpful, consider supporting us through PayPal at Romans chapter 5 at Comcast.net. Welcome to No Compromise, where faith and reason fuse in conversation. Qu'ils sont beaux, les pieds. So, my love, we've gone through another week, and we are now scheduled to complete our discussion of the magician's nephew. Right, exactly. One of our favorite of the Chronicles of Narnia. Right, and we're starting at the end of chapter 8. And what is it that strikes us about this? Well, it is when Aslan is singing the world of Narnia into existence. Oh, right. And some of the things I that we were discussing was um, how his voice is increasing, the sun is rising, it's a young new world. And while all of this is being created and growing and beautiful, the witch is seeing it as terrible and she feels like she has to fly. Right. Fly okay. Away. So let's actually pick it up there. The last few lines of chapter eight, eight. Mm -hmm. of, chapter of chapter eight say eight. this, it was a lion. Huge, shaggy, and bright, it stood facing the risen sun. Its mouth was wide open in song, and it was about 300 yards away. This is a terrible world, said the witch. We must fly at once. Prepare the magic. I quite agree with you, madam, said Uncle Andrew. A most disagreeable place, completely uncivilized. If only I were a younger man and had a gun. So. Yeah, the beginning of the creation, it's interesting how they both see it completely opposite. Right, from how both the witch and Uncle Andrew see it. Right. Um, the witch and Andrew, they want to destroy. Aslan. Right, they want to destroy what's good. Right. And, and this actually plays in really well to our latest edition of The Christian Atheist, The evident Evidence and Faith. Right. Because it's making the point that fundamentally, we either see the world as a good thing or as a bad thing, as something that must be overcome, that something that must be fixed. And the witch and, and Uncle Andrew both see this as a place that needs to be fixed, that is bad, and they yeah. want to get away. Yeah. Whereas the children are intrigued. They see the beauty of the world. They hear the beauty of the voice, and they're not horrified by it. It's not even so much they want to fix it. They want to flee from it. That, that's true. They, they see it as something that is bad. Right. And, and that is that fundamental to, choice. And to destroy it. Right. And they would like to either Crush destroy it. it and make the world after the way they see it or flee entirely, run away, get away from right. it. Um, and that's the fundamental decision that we're talking about. Like in the... In the evident evidence and faith, right. that fundamental faith is either the world is good and you accept it, you believe it, mm -hmm. and you move forward on that basic fundamental faith, or you think the world is bad, evil, and must be corrected by your understanding. Right. And that's the magician's understanding. And because you are God. Right. When you take the position of right. God, you are taking... The, I mean, literally taking it from Aslan. You say, this is bad. I wouldn't mm -hmm. do it this way. I would do it a different way. Mm -hmm. And um, and we see that both in The, the Witch and in Uncle Andrew. Exactly. They both think that the world is created in a bad way and that they would do it differently. Right. All right. So chapter nine. What happens in chapter nine, John? Chapter nine is called The Founding of Narnia. And so we see the beginning, the creation story itself. Of, of Narnia, and of course is, is of profound beauty. As it says in Genesis, God saw that it was good, good, right? And that fundamental distinction that we saw at the end of last chapter between seeing the world as something that we can embrace, that we can love, that we can recognize as was created for our good, mm -hmm. or seeing it as flawed, dangerous, evil, something that needs to be corrected. Exactly. And we see here in chapter 9 that Andrew is done with the witch. Yeah, this is interesting. And now draws a line. Right, right. So Uncle Andrew himself is getting to the point where he sees the witch as something that he must himself flee, 
because she's not working for his best good. Right. So we see the conflict between the two people who want to make themselves God. Right, exactly. So that's the that's the magic on both sides. They are not willing to accept the position of God as given. Right. As Aslan or the emperor. They want to set themselves in that place. Right. And it all comes back to the um the original sin where we are God. Yes. We want to put ourselves in the place of God, which was Satan's sin. Ways, right. Which if you know, if anyone wants to if anyone wants to listen, we are in the process of reading right now um Paradise Lost by John Milton right. on our on Simple, Simple Gifts, Gifts podcast. On Mondays. And Milton <laughs> makes this as clear as possible in Paradise Lost. And so I would encourage those of you who are listening to go to our Simple Gifts podcast and listen to Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm, exactly. You're on chapter two or three now. Okay, let's go to the next thing. Okay, so how about the part when when she throws the lamppost at Aslan's head? Right. The witch, if you remember, has taken from the lamppost in London the crossbar. Right. And on page 63, stop! cried the witch. Stand back. No, further back. If anyone goes within ten paces of either of the children, I will knock out his brains. <laughs> she was poising in her hand the iron bar that she had torn off the lamppost, ready to throw it. Somehow no one doubted that she would be a very good shot. Yeah. So, she said, you would steal back to your own world with the boy and leave me here. Mm -hmm. Uncle Andrew's temper at last got the better of his fears. <laughs> yes, ma'am, I would, he said. Most undoubtedly I would. I should be perfectly in my rights. I have been most shamefully, most abominably treated. So now we find that even Uncle Andrew, Andrew. has a line to draw exactly. with the witch, right? Exactly. Because he himself is feeling oppressed by her. <laughs> it reminds me of all of these the liberals now. They're not like, they're not, you know, to the extreme left, but they're feeling the oppression. They're feeling it in their schools, in the universities. And they're saying, wait a second, we didn't <laughs> want to take it this far. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we said that with, um, especially with Jonathan Haidt, right? Mm -hmm. we, we mentioned that. It's like you, Jonathan Haidt is suddenly recognizing here in 20, in the 2011s through the 20 teens recognizing that the left has gone too far. Right. Well, the left has we, been going... and Exactly. When we read them, we say, wait a second, this has been going <laughs> this on, has been since, going the on since the 60s. This has been going on since the 60s, at least. To, you're and, trying to say it's the 2011. Right, and now, you're, and now you're seeing it finally <laughs> and recognizing mm -hmm. it's gone too far. And isn't that what happened with James Lindsay, too? Right. I, it started I, to creep into his mathematics. Exactly. James math Lindsay... Yeah. who is one of my favorite podcasters, the right. New York Discourses podcast. Highly recommend it to all of our listeners. James Lindsay actually got to the point of saying, wait a sec, this wokeness <laughs> crap is getting into my mathematics. Right. A and he said, we've got to do something about this. And then he woke up to how bad it was right. and now is one of the strongest voices, right. literally. He is. He really um, is. As far as I know, he's the only one that has the same view of Hegel as I do mm -hmm. on this, and and pushes it back to there. Um, I cannot recommend James Lindsay's New Discourses podcasts more strongly yeah. to our listeners. Okay. So what does that have to do with what we're talking about? <laughs> James Lindsay, Jonathan Knight. <laughs> oh, right. right. That, that the back. left is finally recognizing mm -hmm. that things have gone too far. too far. And when they start recognizing it, you know it's really it's, bad. It's, it's the Uncle it, Andrew drawing the line. Right. It's Uncle Andrew, who is kind of a lesser mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the evils, right. trying, finally recognizing that things have gone even too far for him. Right. Exactly. That Jadis is a, a worse evil than he is willing to embrace. Mm -hmm. And that's actually one of the most important points that we need to get across. Right. Because by the end of this, by the end of what we're going to talk about, is drawing that line. Drawing the line. Mm -hmm. Where where, where is are you it going to draw the line? That you're going to draw the line because eventually what always happens on the left mm -hmm. is that they start taking out their own. Right. Because they're not far enough along. Exactly. And um, so we better start drawing our lines quickly. Okay. So at this point, mm -hmm. 
the witch recognizes mm-hmm. that there's nothing more than she can do, and she attacks Aslan. Right. Suddenly, the witch stepped boldly out towards the lion. It was coming on, always singing. So Aslan is in the process of creating the world. He is the eternal word, right. slain before the foundation of the world. But he is he is creating the world with with reason, with rationality. Right. It says, it was coming on, always singing with a slow, heavy pace. It was only 12 yards away. She raised her arm and flung the iron bar straight at its head. Nobody, least of all Jadis, could have missed at that range. The bar struck the lion fair between the eyes. It glanced off and fell with a thud in the grass. The lion came on. Its walk was neither slower nor faster than before. You could not tell whether it even knew it had been hit. Though its soft pads made no noise, you could feel the earth shake beneath their weight. The witch shrieked and ran. It's interesting contrast between Jade is here throwing the bar at his head and it bounces off compared to in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when she has complete control and she kills him right. with her dagger. Right, that triumph, <laughs> that moment of triumph where she feels that she has finally won by killing Aslan. Yeah, but right. it's obvious that it's Aslan who has power over whether she's going to kill him or right. or and even hurt him in any way. This moment yeah. when she flings the thing at him full force, yeah. it strikes him dead between the eyes, and he is not in the least phased. Right. And, and then, it's, yeah, it's like that. I mean, God mm-hmm. is is not susceptible to being damaged by the right. likes of his creation. Exactly. Um, okay, so yeah. what, what would you like to say about this? Well, I love that Jadis, she finds her limit. Mm-hmm. And in, in the Hegelian world, that's the one thing that Hegel, Hegelian ideology, cannot stand, being limited. Mm-hmm. And in the... Right here, Jadis finds her limit. She cannot do anything other than run at this point right. because she has she has reached the limit of her capacity. Right. And so she flees. And that's ultimately the, the course of anyone who opposes God. Exactly. But it is ultimately the course. It isn't the, the, the momentary thing because everyone can oppose God for a while mm-hmm. until it is no longer given them the time. So, yeah, so this is the last we see of Jadis until a little later until in the, the story. Until the garden. Mm-hmm. Right? Because she encounters the one unmovable force, Aslan himself. Right. It's beautiful. Exactly. <laughs> right, so at this point, the story moves on. Mm-hmm. And it comes into Diggory's mind that he should ask Aslan for help with his mother who's dying. Right. And Uncle Andrew is, of course, terrified at any such prospect. Right. And there's one there's one passage here that I thought was worth looking at in relation to that point. Okay, so um, you pointed out that if you look at God as good, if you look at Aslan as good, you will be willing to ask. Right. And, and this we make this point faith. in the evident, evidence and faith. Right. Um, and, and we just finished publishing that series on the Christian Atheist. Um, that if we look at the world as a good place, if we accept that, as God says in Genesis, um, God saw that it was good, then we will be willing to come to being and ask for right. help because we we conceive that the author of the universe is actually on our side, is on the side of good. Right. And so we'll be, we will be free to come to him. Um, whereas if we look at the world from the other perspective, that um, as both Jadis and Uncle Andrew did, that the world is fundamentally flawed in some way, then we will not look to to creation, to the world, to God, to ameliorate the problems. Instead, we will look to ourselves to correct things. Exactly. And that value is human-made. Yeah, the idea that that value is not something that God built into the universe, right. but rather something that human beings create. Mm-hmm. So we know that value is real. And also, we talked about Andrew follows at a cautious space between the rings, that's the children, and Aslan. 
And then as regards oneself, Uncle Andrew continued, in a happy dream, there's no knowing how long I might live if I settled here. And that's a big consideration when a fellow has turned sixty. I shouldn't be surprised if I never grew a day older in this country. Stupendous! The land of youth! Oh, cried Diggory, the land of youth. Do you think it really is? For, of course, he remembered what Aunt Letty had said to the lady who brought the grapes. Mm. And that sweet hope rushed back upon him. Uncle Andrew, he said, do you think there's anything here that would cure a mother? What are you talking about, said Uncle Andrew? This isn't a chemist's shop. But mm. as I was saying, you don't care tuppence about her, said Diggory savagely. I thought you might. After all, she's your sister as well as my mother. Well, no matter. I'm jolly well going to ask the lion himself if he can help me. And he turned and walked briskly away. Polly waited for a moment and then went after him. So that exemplifies exactly what we just said. Right. If about you are willing to believe mm -hmm. that the universe is good, that God created the universe that for you our benefit, faith that it is good. You are willing to go after and ask. Right. And as Jesus said, ask and it will be given you. Right. Seek and exactly. you will find. But notice how Uncle Andrew deals with this. Here, stop, come back. The boy's gone mad, said Uncle Andrew. He followed the children at a cautious distance behind, for he didn't want to get too far away from the green rings. Right. <laughs> or too near the line. As one. Right. So he stays in the happy medium. So we try to we try to have it both ways. Mm -hmm. And this is the point I've tried to make in our series on atheism. Right. That the atheists want to have it both ways. And we saw we saw that very clearly. Um if, if anyone has listened to the debate between Jordan Peterson and Sam um, Harris, and Sam Harris mm -hmm. right? Exactly. P Peterson points that out to Harris. He wants to have it both ways. He wants all of the goodness right. of believing in God without having the reality of God lying behind it. Right, exactly. Um, and so Aunt Uncle Andrew does the same thing here. He wants, he wants the benefit of being able to turn to the magic, and he also wants to, to be able to avoid um, the facing value. the reality that mm -hmm. is God. Exactly. You know. The next part of the, the story goes on with the creation. But mm -hmm. as we move forward, we get to more interesting material, more evocative material. Exactly. The end of this chapter is when Aslan chooses the animals that will Ooh. have rationality. Oh, yeah. This is like a huge mm -hmm. place. This is almost like the birth of man. Right. And, and it reminds us of our picture for the Christian atheist, right? Right, exactly. Um, the the creation of man where God reaches down to Adam. Michelangelo. And Michelangelo's, mm -hmm. what is that called? Michelangelo's. Isn't that, isn't that creation? Is it creation? Michelangelo's creation? With that I'm finger sure. where God reaches his finger down from heaven and Adam reaches up. This is very much that same moment in, uh, in the Chronicles of Narnia. Mm -hmm. And now, for the first time, the lion was quite silent. He was going to and fro among the animals, and every now and then he would go up to two of them, always two at a time, and touch their noses with his. He would touch two beavers among all the beavers, two leopards among all the leopards, one stag and one deer among all the deer, and leave the rest. Some sorts of animals he passed over altogether, but the pairs which he had touched instantly left their own kinds and followed him. At last he stood still, and all the creatures whom he had touched came and stood in a wide circle around him. Mm -hmm. And this week, I mean, we might consider this like the election exactly. of God. Mm -hmm. So he chooses those whom he will raise and bring to the, the rational status of beings of being. that will be blessed by God. Exactly. The others whom he had not touched began to wander away. Their noises faded gradually into the distance. The chosen beasts who remained were now utterly silent, all with their eyes fixed intently upon the lion. For the first time that day, there was complete silence. Diggory's heart beat wildly. He knew something very solemn was going to be done. And this is really an important point. Mm -hmm. He had not forgotten about his mother. Mm -hmm. He still had his petition for his mother in exactly. his mind. 
But he knew jolly well Not. that even for her, mm -hmm. he couldn't interrupt a right. thing. Yes. Right, exactly. And all through the story, he does that. Right. There is that, that always... notion that Diggory has that there is a reality to which he must submit. Right. And that's that same sense mm -hmm. that the world is a good world and that we are we should submit ourselves to it rather mm -hmm. than seeking to submit it to, to ourselves, our, right. the magician's place. Exactly. Right. Exactly. The lion, whose eyes never blinked, stared at the animals as hard as if he was going to burn them up with his mere stare. And gradually, a change came over them. Many animals sat up on their hind legs. Most put their heads on one side, as if they were trying very hard to understand. The lion opened his mouth. And here we go. Mm -hmm. This is like really exciting. The lion opened his mouth, but no sound came from it. He was breathing out a long, warm breath. It seemed to sway all the beasts as the wind sways a line of trees. Mm -hmm. Far overhead from beyond the veil of blue sky which hid them, the stars sang again. A pure, cold, difficult music, right? Because right. rationality is a complex thing. Exactly. Then there came a swift flash. The enlightening of God. This is like the, the image of God being imparted to, um, to his creation. Then there came a swift flash, like fire, but it burnt nobody, either from the sky or from the lion itself. And every drop of blood tingled in the children's bodies. And the deepest, wildest voice they had ever heard was saying, Narnia, 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 awake, love, think, speak. Be walking trees, be talking beasts, be divine waters. And this is that moment of mm -hmm. God reaching down and imparting the imago dei, the image of God into his creation. Mm -hmm. And that's such a, oh, he that's gives, such a beautiful moment. He, I give you yourselves, I give you myself. Oh, right. That's the next thing. Mm -hmm. It was, of course, the lion's voice, it says in chapter 10. The children had long felt sure that he could speak, yet it was lovely and terrible shock when he did. Creatures, I give you yourselves, said the strong, happy voice of Aslan. I give you forever this land of Narnia. I give you the woods, the fruits, the rivers. I give you the stars. <laughs> and this makes me cry. And I give you myself. The dumb beasts who I have not chosen are yours also. Treat them gently and cherish them, but do not go back to their ways, lest you cease to be talking beasts. For out of them you were taken, and into them you can return. Do not so. There's that warning and promise. Mm -hmm. I mean, th this is interesting because just recently we've talked about the finding of that defixio, mm -hmm. and it, it, it mirrors the the cursings from Mount Ebal exactly, and the blessings from Mount Gerizim, mm -hmm. right? And God always imparts to us responsibility. Exactly. That sense in which we do what was what is right or we pay the consequences. Right. Um, and it's exactly the same here in, in Narnia. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's really beautiful. And I love that Aslan says, I give to you myself. Um, and, and that's like the greatest of all gifts, right? Exactly. We get all of the greatness, all the goodness that God has given to us, right. and we get God himself. Right. If we are willing to accept him, right. Emmanuel. instead of raising ourselves to that position. Mm -hmm. And he gives us the choice, which is a great choice, right? To to live up to the imago dei that, dei that he's put in a, into exactly. us. Exactly. Or to decline into into the life of the animals again, right. the dumb animals. Mm. Okay, good. Okay, so now we move on to chapter ten. Wow. Okay, so we skip we skip the whole rest of this chapter. <laughs> um, this is when the <laughs> Andrew is unable to see reality. <laughs> okay. Chapter 10 is called Diggory and his uncle mm -hmm. are both in trouble. In trouble. 
So we skip forward then to where Diggory first comes to see Aslan. We know that his purpose is that he wants to come to Aslan to ask for his mother's sake that um, that she be healed. Right. He wants to ask Aslan. So this is like petitionary prayer. Right. He's coming to Aslan. He sees him as as the the great power, mm-hmm. um, and he comes to him to ask him um, for a favor. Meanwhile, Andrew is left high and dry by the witch. <laughs> She's gone. And right. he's left behind right. um, with all the um, the wondering of the animals, whether he's a plant or is he an animal? <laughs> and what do we do Poor with Uncle him Andrew. now? Yes. <laughs> what do we do with him now? <laughs> yes. Uncle Andrew is bereft. Um, and that's because anytime you adopt a an ends justify the means morality, right. Um, I guess that's a good name for what, remember we were trying to figure out what to call it. We said, what is the witch? She's feminism. She's the spirit of the age. She's being in God's place. Right. She's Almost the, the same spirit of Cain. Yep. She's progressivism. She's Marxism. Right. She's um, revolving around yourself. Right. As, as Marx All of said. those things. So yep. we were trying to figure out what we should call it. What did you just call it? Um, what did the I ends call? justifies the means. Ah, yes, the ends justify the right. means morality. Yeah, and ideology. Jadis, what's that? <laughs> ideology. Ideology. Jadis, <laughs> rec- Jadis abandons so, Aunt Uncle Andrew as soon as he ceases right. to be of any use to her. Right, self-worship. Right, self, uh, yeah, that's it, exactly. Self-worship. Putting oneself in the place of God, um, Elevating oneself to the highest of values, exactly. and both Andrew and Jadis do this. Exactly, it's why Jadis was, it's why Uncle Andrew was willing to abandon Jadis um, when he felt that he had been wronged by her, and why Jadis abandons Andrew as soon as she no longer finds any use with him. Right. So Andrew is now left high and dry. Yes. And the animals, who actually are trying to help him. <laughs> the try- animals are much They're trying very to hard. Yes. They're trying very hard to help him. They yep. just don't know what he is. What is he? Is he Can't an animal or a plant? Uncle Andrew out. Exactly. Animal, vegetable, or mineral. <laughs> 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 but at much this point, clearly. Andrew is not interested in the evidence, what was really going on. Right. <clears throat> he thinks he sees dangerous animals. And that's all he sees. Mm-hmm. So actually, he doesn't even see what's even directly in front of him. Reality, right? He refuses to see reality. Right, and we'll he's, get that even more clearly later on. He's like seeing the rational, you know, the rational structure that that he built. Right. He elevates his own rational understanding above mm-hmm. the reality that's surrounding him. Right. Yep. Okay. So where do you want to go? Do you want to go to well, Diggory or Andrew at this yeah, point? Let's let's go forward to Diggory at this point okay, because he ahead. comes to visit Aslan. Um, and he says, let's see, in the middle of the chapter, please, Mr. Lion, Aslan, sir, said Diggory, could you, may I please, will you give me some magic fruit of this country to make my mother well? And it's certainly to Diggory's credit Mm -hmm. that he's always looking out for his mother. He wants, he wants to help his mother. Um, and Aslan tells him what? And it's interesting how Aslan responds. Uh He, tells him he had been explain. desperately hoping that the lion would say yes. He had been horribly afraid it might say no. Mm-hmm. But he was taken aback when it did neither. Right. This is the boy, said Aslan, looking not at Diggory, but at his counselors. This is the boy who did it. Oh, dear, thought Diggory. What have I done now? <laughs> Son of Adam, said the lion. There is an evil witch abroad in my new land of Narnia. Tell these good beasts how she came here. A dozen different things that he might say flashed through Diggory's mind. But he had the sense to say nothing except the exact truth. Exactly. This is, this is a trap that we all fall into in today's world. This idea that we can bend the truth. Mm-hmm. We do it all the time. But when we bend the truth, we're seeking to bend reality. Exactly. And reality always snaps back and hits us in the face. Mm-hmm. 
because truth is not something that can be bent. It is reality itself. And usually, Diggory notices that mm -hmm. and, and responds. I brought her, Aslan, he answered in a low voice. For what purpose? I wanted to get her out of my own world and back into her own. I thought I was taking her back to her own place. How came she to be in your world, son of Adam? By, by magic. Of course, this is like analogous to the woman you gave me. Right, that, exactly. That Adam, that Adam pulled, right? Exactly. And of course, Diggory rang the bell, right. which is Diggory. analogous to eating, eating, eating the, the apple. Fruit. Right. Mm -hmm. The lion said nothing, and Diggory knew that he had not told enough. It was my uncle, Aslan, and so again he tries to shift the blame. <laughs> he sent us out of our own world by magic rings. At least I had to go because he sent Polly first. And then we met the witch in a place called Charn, and she just held on to us when you met the witch, said Aslan, <laughs> in a low voice, which had the threat of a growl in it. She woke up, said Diggory wretchedly, and then turning very white. I mean, I woke her because I wanted to know what would happen if I struck a bell. And then he says, Polly didn't want to. Uh oh, here we go. <laughs> it wasn't her fault. Yeah. I love that so much. Yeah. Because it's like he refuses to blame, to blame Polly anybody. for what he knows right. what his was his fault. Be and careful. that's like reversing Adam. Right. You know, this woman that you gave me. <laughs> I love that Diggory takes responsibility here. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, be careful because you're making John blubber. <laughs> I, I fought her. I knew I shouldn't have. I think I was a bit enchanted by the writing under the mm -hmm. bell. Do you, said Aslan, still speaking very low and deep. No, said Diggory. And one of the great things here is that Aslan mm -hmm. insists on truth. Right. Why? Because I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. The truth may not be twisted. Right. It must simply be accepted. It must be faced and lived. No, said Diggory. I see now I wasn't. I was only pretending. There was a long pause, and Diggory was thinking all the time, I've spoiled everything. There's no chance of getting anything from Mother now. When the lion spoke again, it was not to Diggory. You see, friends, he said, that before the new clean world I gave you is seven hours old, a force of evil has already entered it, waked and brought hither by this son of Adam. Mm -hmm. Aslan is not the nice person that we always like to think of Jesus right. as in our exactly. contemporary evangelical culture. Mm -hmm. Aslan was harsh because mm -hmm. the truth can be harsh. Exactly. He makes Diggory responsible, fully responsible mm -hmm. for what he did. <laughs> but do not be... Ca Go ahead. I was going to say, remember the days of with the kids, you know, one would blame another and then you'd have to get the story... And go with backwards your, with your and kids. Backwards, yes, and backwards. You keep have to pushing it back farther <laughs> exactly. and farther to get the truth. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> because we are as human beings mm -hmm. so willing to mm -hmm. bend to do what magicians do, right? To bend the truth, exactly. To try to support our own narrative, exactly. our own story, our own version of events, instead of the truth. That's so good. But do not be cast down," said Aslan still speaking to the beasts. Evil will come of that evil, but it is still a long way off. And I will see that the worst falls on myself. And that's, of course, what God always does. Exactly. The that's worst the always deep, falls on him. That's the deep magic. The deep magic, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. The deeper and magic. The witch's magic only goes back to, to the beginning. as we see in the, the line, the witch in the wardrobe, only to the beginning of time. The dawn of time. But mm -hmm. she does not understand the deeper magic. Exactly. So even the greatest of the magicians mm -hmm. is ignorant. Exactly. Which brings us back to Andrew. He missed the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He misses the point of the song. Um, I mean, he realized the song was a song 
but he disliked the song. Ooh, yeah, where is this found? Page 75. When the sun rose and he saw the line, he tried to deny it was a song. Do you remember he tried to deny it was a song and only all he heard was roaring and... Oh, yes, this is it. I mean, he was denying the evidence, clearly. Right. When the great moment came and the beast spoke, Uncle Andrew missed the whole point Mm -hmm. for a rather interesting reason. When the lion had first begun singing long ago, while it was still dark... He had realized that the noise was a song. Right. He realized it, but... And there's the evident. Mm -hmm, It's like, there it is. It's right in front of you. You can accept it. Or you can do what he did. Rationalize it away. No, he disliked it. Well, he disliked it. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. And And because he disliked it, because it's a value question, right? And that's the point about the whole, the evident evidence and faith. Mm -hmm. It's a value question. Because he disliked it, he he dismissed it and he rationalized it away. And yes. that is the process. That's kind of like the process of like the atheist. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, we we don't want to come to the conclusion that there is a God. Exactly. Because then we are responsible for our world and our actions in that world. And the trouble with that is when you make yourself stupid. <laughs> you usually succeed <laughs> at doing it. Right. You That's succeed. actually worth reading. So. Oh. When the lion had first begun singing long ago while it was still dark, he had realized that the noise was a song. There's the evidence. Right. And he had disliked the song very much. Mm -hmm. And that's that's value itself. Mm -hmm. It made him think and feel things he did not want to think and feel. So, again, it's at that very level of value itself. Not at the level of rationality. Mm Mm-hmm. But he's in, it makes you deny the evidence. Exactly. Then when the sun rose and he saw that the singer was a lion, only a lion, as he said to himself, he tried his hardest to make believe that it wasn't singing and never had <laughs> been singing, only roaring as any lion might right. in a zoo in our own world. So he returns to the familiar. Mm-hmm. He returns to his rationalization and he denies mm-hmm. what is evident. And in doing that, he becomes a fool. He tried his hardest to make believe that it wasn't singing and never had been singing, only roaring, as any lion might, in a zoo in our own world. Of course it can't really have been singing, he thought. I must have imagined it. I've been letting my nerves get out of order. Who ever heard of a lion singing? And the longer, and more beautiful the lion sang, the harder Uncle Andrew tried to make himself believe that he could hear nothing but roaring. Mm-hmm. Now, the trouble about, and this is, this is that line it's that we both key. really like. Yeah. Now, the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are <laughs> is that you very often succeed. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on denying the evidence, mm-hmm. and eventually you'll succeed in making mm-hmm. yourself stupider than you really are. And all he heard was roaring. Right. And then in the end, he has rage and horror as he watched Diggory walking towards the lion. Right. Because it's like, wait a second, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You you foolish, foolish boy. He has Don't horror. you realize, yeah, that but you then, are heading towards danger. Right. And then he has rage because he's thinking selfishly because they have the rings in their pockets and here they're going to... They're going to go towards the lion and be eaten by him, and then he's going to lose his chance to go back to his world. Right. The actual line is, then to his utter rage and horror, he saw the other three humans actually walking out into the open to meet the animals. So he convinced himself that there's no possible way that this could possibly be true. So he rationalized everything away, and then he called those who were actually listening to the 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 evidence mm-hmm. following the evidence mm-hmm. he called them fools right and this is what we christians get all the time right. from the atheists mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. you are you're an utter idiot for believing this stuff <laughs> yes. when they've convinced themselves against their own better judgment exactly. originally that um, the truth is there Exactly. The fools, he said to himself, now those brutes will eat the rings along with the children and I'll never be able to get home again. What a selfish little boy that Diggory is. <laughs> and, and how many times? Go ahead. It was just 
it's just so typical uh-huh. of of like the leftist mm-hmm. and I know I keep going here I know but the the leftist ideology right that that will use the ethics the ethical impulses of those of us who stand with traditional ethics mm-hmm. against us exactly that's what I was going to say if they want to throw away their own lives that's their business but what about me <laughs> they don't seem to ever to think of that. No one thinks of me. Right. Well, no one has to think of him because he's the you know, he thinks constantly of himself. Exactly. Right. He never thinks of anybody but himself. Okay. So now we're on to chapter twelve. And Diggory he goes to Aslan and he and he discusses his need for something that would heal his mother, and he expects Aslan to say yes or no, but instead, what does he see? He sees Aslan crying. Right, and Aslan says Mm -hmm. to Diggory, Son of Adam, are you ready to undo the wrong that you have done to my sweet country of Narnia on the very day of its birth? Well, I don't see what I can do, said Diggory. You seen the queen ran away, and... I asked, are you ready, said the lion. Yes, said Diggory. Mm -hmm. He had, for a second, some wild idea of saying, I'll try to help you if you promise to help my mother. But he realized in time that the lion was not at all the sort of person one could try to make bargains with. The truth is not. You either obey it, you follow it, you embrace it, or you deny it. Exactly. Those are your two options. Exactly. But when he had said yes, he thought of his mother. And he thought of the great hopes he had had, and how they were all dying away. And a lump came into his throat, and tears in his eyes, and he blurted out, But please, please, won't you? Can't you give me something that will cure mother? Up till then he had been looking at the lion's great feet and the huge claws on them. Now, in his despair, he looked up at its face. What he saw surprised him as much as anything in his whole life. Right. For the tawny face was bent down near his own, and wonder of wonders, great, shining, tears stood in the lion's eyes. They were such big, bright tears compared with Diggory's own that for a moment he felt as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than himself. Than he was himself. Exactly. Yes. God cares far more than we do. Exactly. About all of these things. My son, my son, said Aslan. I know. Grief is great. Only you and I in this land know that yet. Let us be good to one another. Yes. And then Aslan decides then to send Diggory. Yeah, he sends D- Diggory on the errand. On an errand. To okay. get a fruit. To get a fruit. To to undo the damage that he did. That he's him, done. He did himself. But this this journey is full of unknown dangers. Mm-hmm. That Diggory himself has no idea. And of course, Aslan, as the eternal word, is very cognizant very of as he said it. Mm-hmm. So Diggory, Polly, they they go on the journey with Strawberry the horse. Who has become this, fledged the I flying was gonna horse. Say, yeah, right? he's Aslan turns him into fledged, fledged, yes. Right, and he has wings. Yep, and so they go flying off. Right. To a garden. Right. And um Which is an interesting garden. <laughs> yeah, but between the time they leave to the time they get there, they take a break someplace and the witch overhears remember the witch overhears right. their talk. They discuss what's going on right. during their break and the witch happens to hear what's going on. Right. So the witch actually goes, hears from them what the what the journey is and what right. the purpose of it is. Right. And apparently she gets the idea that she's going to go to the to, garden. To the garden herself. Mm-hmm. From them. And she ends up getting there, I guess, first, huh? From gets there first, yes. And the next chapter opens up with the garden. Right. And the the next chapter is called An Unexpected Meeting. Right. Um, it's coming from that valley with the lake in it, said Fledge. So it is, said Diggory. And look, there's a green hill at the far end of the lake, and look how blue the water is. It must be the place, said all three. So they land. The steep green hill was rushing towards them. A moment later, he alighted on its slope a little awkwardly. The children rolled off without hurting themselves on the warm, fine grass and stood up panting a little. They were three-quarters of the way up the hill, 
and set out at once to climb to the top. All round the very top of the hill ran a high wall of green turf. Inside the wall trees were growing. Their branches hung out over the wall. Their leaves showed not only green but also blue and silver when the wind stirred them. When the travelers reached the top, they walked all the way round it inside the green wall before they found the gates. High gates of gold, fast shut, facing due east. Up till now, I think, Fledge and Polly had the idea that they would go in with Diggory, but they thought so no longer. You never saw a place which was so obviously private. You could see at a glance that it belonged to someone else. So this is like a divine place. Yeah, and we're trying to figure out what this is because in The Horse and His Boy, the third book, if you read chronologically, right. there's the hermit. The hermit of the southern lives, march. Right, and he lives in a place that is walled around. With green turf. Right. Exactly and the same. And there's a uh, tree. And when Shasta goes in, he says it's the most beautiful tree he's ever seen. Right. So and we're if trying anybody, to... Yeah, if anybody has any ideas, we'd love to hear you discuss them in, in the comments. Yeah, we're, we're trying to yeah. figure out the status of, of this, what Lewis had in mind. Right. Exactly. Is um, it a traveling garden? Is it kind or of like the, it... the room of requirement? Right. In, in, in Harry uh, Potter? Harry Potter? Is or... it as a peer at the time? Or are there like one of these at each of the four corners of the yeah. you know, north, east, south, and west? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of puzzling. We'd love you know, to hear you, what you think. Right. It almost yeah. seems like it's a theophany. Yeah, exactly. Like an appearance of God. If you're familiar the with times. the Chronicles of Narnia. Right. You know, leave a comment what you think, what you think about it. We'd love to hear um, our viewers' ideas on this. Yeah. Up till now, I think Fledge and Polly had the idea that they would go in with Diggory, but mm -hmm. they thought so no longer. You could see at a glance that it belonged to someone else. Only a fool would dream of going in unless he had been sent there on very special business. So there is an order, a structure, I was a say, legal a structure. Path exactly. to go there mm -hmm. properly. Right? And that's very important for exactly. Lewis and, and for anything in the Chronicles of Narnia. The idea that there is a right way to do things right. and a wrong way. And Diggory does go the right way. Right. Diggory has been sent there. He right. has a... Um, he's been given the right to enter the garden for a specific reason. Exactly. Diggory himself understood at once that the others wouldn't and couldn't come in with him. He went forward to the gates alone. When he had come close to them, he saw words written on the gold with silver letters, something like this. And this is an important inscription. Exactly. Come in by the gold gates, or not at all. Take of my fruit for others, or forbear. For those who steal, or those who climb my wall, shall find their heart's desire, and find despair. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of um, the first Adam in the Bible. Right. The first Adam is told, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then, um, after he has and he sinned, he says, Jesus says, come and eat of me. In this case, the bell, remember, Diggory rings the bell right. and it says, you know, you don't want to do this. Right. Um, he's warned. Right. And now he's at this garden and it says, come on in. Right. And he's, it, it's, the, it's the difference between mm -hmm. God telling you what to do. Right. And your own sort of desires. Right. Driving you in, in an improper direction. In the garden, you're told, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree of life stands next to that tree. Right. Then Jesus comes and says, eat of the tree of life. Right. He is the tree of right. life. Right. Just like, right. and here the bell, with theory, the bell is eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right. And There's the, a, the right way to do things right. and the wrong way. And the garden is like, come and eat of the tree of life. Take but a, do it my way. Yes. God's way. Take of my fruit for others, said Diggory to himself. Well, that's what I'm going to do. It means I mustn't eat any myself, I suppose. I don't know <laughs> what all that jaw in the last line is about. Come in by the gold gates. Well, who'd want to climb a wall if he could get in by a gate? But how did the gates open? He laid his hand on them, and instantly they swung apart. 
opening inwards, turning on their hinges without the least noise. <laughs> so God invites us in and he makes sure that we have a pathway forward. But if God is, is forbidding it, then right. we'd best listen to that too. As in contrast to the witch when she uses her powers to break down the wall. Right, back in Charm. Yes, mm -hmm. yep. And I, I, I can't help going there so the <laughs> the idea of it's like sexuality mm -hmm. god has this very specific plan for it mm -hmm. and if you follow the plan it is beautiful it's fantastic it's one of the greatest things you can enjoy in life but if you if you pluck the unripe fruit or you pluck it in the wrong way mm -hmm. you're going to bear evil consequences exactly. for the rest of your life um, and we we've lost that wisdom exactly. in our culture, mm -hmm. the hookup culture of our current world. Exactly. It's like That's we've just destroyed one, one of the most sacred things mm -hmm. in, in creation. Exactly. And even in this story. Yeah, very in, clearly in the story. In, yes. Well, I'm saying in this story, the institution of marriage, when yes. it comes to the cabbie and his wife and just the purity and in that innocence yes. and the yeah that is so beautiful yeah when we get to that point and, mm -hmm. and aslan says to the cabbie you should be king of this world and he said well you see aslan i'm <laughs> i'm a married man it's like <laughs> I, I can see myself exactly in that position <laughs> well aslan you may have put me in you may have put me in in eden here in the eden. greatest <laughs> position ever but if you've left jenny behind yeah. It's nothing. I don't. Yeah, want, exactly. I don't really want it. And of course, Aslan knows that, and he brings exactly. her immediately to the cabbie because he recognizes the sacredness of that of, of that connection. Right. Well, on that note, my lover, mm -hmm. we are almost an hour in and still have as much to cover. I know. I know. <laughs> Next week, we'll wrap mm -hmm. up our coverage of the magician's nephew. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. I am a Christian with the searching and skeptical mind of an atheist. I don't want to believe anything that isn't true. I know both sides of the looking glass and I know them with open eyes. I choose Christ's side. I invite you to join me from wherever you stand before the looking glass. That's this week's episode. Thanks for listening and remember you can have your religious cake and eat it too. You can have reason, respect for science, a 21st century worldview, and be a Christian.